Good morning, everyone. I'm excited for the, our day today. Uh, first off, I want to thank our sponsors listed here. Uh, kicking off our day is Stephanie with her talk, You Are the Prize, How to Hire the Right Boss and Employer for a More Fulfilling Career. Stephanie is known for her candor and her career experiences in tech, and she currently works as a oper in operational security at DuoSec and is here to discuss how to navigate the complex technical career growth and search environments. Hello everyone, thank you so much for attending my talk. Today I'm going to be talking about how you are the prize, um, how to hire your boss and employer for a more fulfilling career. But first I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. I've been in the tech industry for about eight years now, eight years this summer exactly. Um, and I've been in the security industry or space for about five years. Uh, two of those years I was doing support and the last three I've been a security practitioner. Before getting into security, I was in technical support, doing anything from Linux administration on a junior level to help desk to network administration. Um, I've kind of touched a couple of things in my career in tech. In addition to that, and what I do in my nine to five is I'm a writer. I've written blog posts. I've also written articles for different people. Um, so I tend to have hung my hat on the writing thing for a long time. Um, I'm also a LinkedIn learning instructor. I have a course out now on social engineering from a, from a security awareness perspective. And I'm a podcaster, uh, though my current podcast has recently shut down. I tend to like podcasts and podcasting in general. So I tend to love to do those interviews. Um, I'm a speaker, as is evident by what I'm doing today, uh, doing this keynote. I am a speaker, and I've been doing this for about the last couple of years. And I'm a psychology enthusiast. I take a lot of time reading a lot of different material and books um, on psychology subjects, and it's just something of a pet project of mine to accumulate as much information as possible, uh, because I feel like getting to know the human beings and how they work definitely make life a lot easier when it comes to navigating um, this life. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Today, we're gonna to be talking about a few different things. Uh, we're gonna be addressing where we get it wrong when it comes to the job hunting and interviewing process. Um, how we have certain problematic mindsets that could kind of deter, deter us or remove us from our journey to job satisfaction. Um, then we're gonna dive into what you should do before applying to a job period. The things that you should think about and address before you even um, reach out to different jobs uh, for employment. We're gonna dive into the interview process, uh, which is never fun, never a breeze. However, there are some mindset shifts that you can make that will make this a lot easier than you probably intend. And then we're gonna dive into a few resources that I've found very, very valuable on my own journey um, and things that you can take forward when it comes to this process of hiring the right employer. So first, we are talking about where we went wrong. Before I go into this, I kind of want to talk about the inspiration for this talk. So I've had over 20 interviews in the last eight years for nine different companies. I know, that's a whole lot. Uh, I definitely had a goal in mind when it came to my career and I like to hit the ground running, which is why I definitely took my time to explore different companies, different environments and get to know myself better and who I was as a worker. Um, but in this process, you kind of learn a lot about how things go naturally um, and the mindset shifts that we all need to make in order to go through this a lot less painfully uh, and a lot more confidently. So when I was in the interview process, I always had this anxious feeling of will they pick me? Won't they pick me? Do they think that I'm a valid or viable candidate? Um, are they excited about me as much as I'm excited about them? Um, always externally based, always wondering if I were the right fit for the job. Um, 
So after some time and after the things that I will discuss today, some of them being mindset shifts, some of that being networking and meeting different people who kind of expose you to different truths, um, I began to take my power back in the interviewing process. I began to think of things in a different light, which is what I'll discuss today. Uh, and a lot of that is also attributed to meeting Kirsten Brazier, um, who has also done a keynote two years ago, I believe, um, for the, the Diana Initiative. Uh, so following in her footsteps, but uh, she definitely taught me a lot about the interviewing process, how I should view myself, what I should tell myself, the affirmations I should give myself in order to move confidently and as confidently as others in this space tend to be. So all of these things kind of have informed my experience and definitely has informed the way that I think about the interviewing process today, no matter how I stack up. Um, no matter what skills I have or the years of experience I have or what certs I have, I definitely have a different mindset when it comes to considering myself in the space. And I think that doing so helps you to be the perfect advocate for yourself in those spaces as well. Um, interviews tend to be a very, very big shift in dynamic when it comes to authority level. Uh, so sometimes we can get very intimidated, especially when we are anxious um, and just thinking about them picking us and not really thinking about it the other way around. So this is the inspiration for this talk and why I decided it might be something that might be helpful to a lot of people. So in order to help me illustrate what I'm going to be talking about today, I am going to introduce a fictional character named Sage. Sage is going to help me illustrate the ways in which you can make these changes and the ways in which you can uh, kind of understand better the concept that I'm going to be discussing today. Um, so who is Sage? What is she about? Um, we're gonna get into that in the next slide. So Sage, right? This fictional character that I've come up with just for the purposes of this keynote. Uh, Sage has worked in cybersecurity for about five years now. Um, and Sage hasn't had the best luck when it comes to roles. She keeps kind of brushing up against the same, uh, the same feeling of, I don't know what's wrong with me or the roles I'm getting, but I'm just not satisfied at all. I feel like it's not a big fit and not, not a good fit. Um, and she's kind of made a lot of mistakes when it comes to the hiring process and hiring the right boss and employer. So at this point, uh, Sage also has a very severe case of imposter syndrome um, and wants to move on to a new job. So there's a couple things here that I think is familiar for all of us uh, when it comes to job hunting. A lot of us are really eager to move into new spaces. Um, there are some of us who are a little bit more chill when it comes to job hunting, but most of us, by the time we're looking for a job, we kind of want to get out as quick as possible. So um, Sage here is kind of worried because she feels like a fraud, like many of us feel. Um, and so she's kind of wondering, what are my job prospects? What is this process going to be like? How do I get into a different position or a different company where I can experience higher job satisfaction? All of this is running through her head. So I want you to keep Sage in mind because I'll be bringing her up throughout this presentation. So where do we get it wrong? Back to the major point of this section. So I talked about mindsets before and what that would look like. And uh, sometimes where we get it wrong is how we think or perceive the situation. So when it comes to the job hunting or interview process, a lot of times we are operating from a survival uh, mindset. So like I was describing, Sage is in a position where she has imposter syndrome. She doesn't really feel confident in her ability to um, do what she has been paid to do this entire time. Uh, and she also has a severe case of, um, she also wants to move to a new job. Sorry. She also wants to move to a new job and a new role, and she has outgrown the role. And we'll discuss later on what her specific reasons are. Uh, but for right now, all we know is she's probably got a survival mindset because she's ready to go. She's ready to leave. Um, there's also another mindset that kind of seems good on the nose, but if you dig a little deeper, it can be problematic depending on 
um, depending on how you are proceeding with this mindset. And that's the ambitious mindset. So when you think about that, you think about the overachiever, um, and we'll dive into that in a few, uh, in a few slides as well. Um, having a pick me attitude, that phrase is coming up again, and we're definitely going to talk about that shortly. Focusing on the value we bring to the table before the interview. So a lot of this is uh, important and something that we've been taught. Everybody's been taught to look at the, re the, rec the, the requirements and see where you fit. Um, everybody's been taught to uh, stack themselves, their resume against the requirements and see if that's even a thing. Uh, however, we all know there are some people who end up applying anyway and getting the position because a lot of job recs tend to be wishless um, if we're being 100% honest. Um, and so another thing is imposter syndrome and lack of confidence that definitely gets in the way of us confidently picking the right job environment for us moving forward and the right roles. Um, so in this gift here has one of my, you know, top, top shows, uh, Shit's Creek, where um, right here it's talking about you're clearly very desperate. <laughs> um, and I feel like a lot of these mindsets, a lot of these things kind of make us come across as desperate, which puts us in a position to be taken advantage of. And that's not a position of power and definitely not a position we want to be in when it comes to hiring the right boss. So the ambitious mindset. That is one of the mindsets that I mentioned pre in the previous slide. So right here, we are thinking about this lovely gift on the left side where it talks about must, I must achieve. Like if this person's a showstopper, this person's an overachiever, definitely goal oriented. They're joining the company for a specific reason and nothing other than that. Um, they take any job at any pay as long as it's aligned with their goals. Um, the problem with this tends to be that there is a potential from, for some sort of disappointment. Sometimes you may overachieve, you may work very hard and then realize that there's no promotion path uh, or they restructured everything in the department and you are no longer in line for the promotion or the job that you wanted or they outsource an entire department. These are things that have actually happened to me uh, and you end up uh, having no path at all forward and your job is pretty much rendered a dead end job. So when you go into it only thinking about the end in mind, I think it tends to create a problem because yeah, you might ignore a whole bunch of stuff to get to where you're going because you're thinking about the end in mind. However, you end up investing a lot beforehand and burning yourself out because of this. Um, and burnout does not help for anything. We end up working worse. <laughs> our mood is affected, the people around us are affected. So it's definitely not something that we want to do. Also, the ambitious mindset kind of still has a pick me attitude, even though it kind of is manifesting differently than the survival mindset, you're definitely still wanting to be picked. You do extra things, you pick up extra shifts, you volunteer for extra things because you want people to notice, you want to look good, and you want people to put you up for different promotions and jobs like that. So. The ambitious mindset is a great mindset to have. I would never, ever, ever tell anyone not to be ambitious, but it's one that can cloud our judgment when it comes to hiring the right employer. So we definitely have to keep that in check when it comes to looking for the right fit. And then we have the survival mindset. So when it comes to the survival mindset, Sage is in survival mode, which is, I gotta get out of here. I, I actually don't care where I go. I don't care about the specifics of the job I work. Sometimes you will do something completely different than anything that you've ever done before because you need to get out, whether that be a bad boss or a toxic work culture or no work-life balance or you're burnt out and there's no release from that or relief from that. There are so many reasons why you enter into a survival mindset. It could also be that people are like leaving like flies, the workload is crazy, so many different reasons. Um, and so when it comes to the survival mindset, you, it puts you in the mode of, I got to get out of here and I got to get out of here fast. And you're essentially running away from a job rather than running towards another job. So at this point, you're not operating in your best uh, power either. 
Um, and this is kind of worse because you are going to potentially put yourself in a really, really bad situation just because you're running away from an, a not so great work environment. Now, of course, um, not talking specifically about uh, situations where the environment is particularly abusive or harmful to you, um, only talking about environments where it's uncomfortable to work there um, and you would rather go into another. This person also has a pick me attitude. Um, however, it's more like a save me attitude because you want to be saved from your work environment. You are very, very over it. <laughs> and I've also been there as well. I know a lot of us can relate. And at this point, you do take anything. And so because of that, you end up giving a lot of leverage to the interviewer and probably ending up less happy than you were before. So this pick me, pick me attitude that I've been talking about, I wanted to dive into that a little deeper as well. When it comes to this pick me attitude, um, uh, it's all about what can I offer? You know, what can I offer them? How do I stack up to them? How do they see me? Um, it's a lot of anxious and nervous energy. Uh, you're going in kind of kind of like a desperation clouding over you um, and also clouding your judgment. You end up missing red flags because you're not listening for them. You're more concerned about how do I look to you rather than how do you look back to me? Uh, and it's just this, pri this, uh, this sense of I'm not the prize. The job is the prize, um, which the job is the prize. But I think what we're talking about here and what we're going to discuss here is how to make that equal. The job is the prize and so are you. Uh, so this is kind of a very dangerous mindset, just like the other ones. It's a, it, and it accompanies both mindsets. Um, and just something that we want to make sure that we are not engaging in. So keeping this in mind. So now we're diving into the portion of the talk where we talk about before you apply. Now, I will be very honest. The first four or five jobs that I had in my industry, I did not properly prepare uh, from the mindset that I'm talking about today. I mostly thought about what I would get out of the job in terms of the ambitious mindset and whether or not they would take me. So I didn't do a lot of this prep for many jobs, and I ended up experiencing many difficulties as a result of that. Uh, so today, I'm really hoping that this, some of this hits home. One of the first things that you should do before you apply is reflect. You need to take some time thinking about certain questions that will help you narrow down the search, number one, and help you weed out any companies that just don't align uh, with what you're thinking about. So when you reflect, you think about past jobs, past bosses, past positions, and you ask yourself, what worked? What didn't work? And what was missing? So when you think about what worked, you have to really consider, okay, I liked aspects of the job, hopefully. We're hoping that you actually like something about the job. Think about those things that you liked and why you liked them. Uh, think, to, think about why they worked. If it was a flexible schedule, think about the purpose for your life and that it, that it brings. Um, what didn't work is very important and probably something that you wouldn't even need to write down. You could probably rattle it off if you're, if you're in survival mindset, which is, I know what I didn't like. <laughs> I know what I didn't want any more of, or I know what I was struggling with. So that's something to reflect on and take note of as well. And then what's missing? What, what was neither there, but you would like there? It wasn't at your current job or it wasn't necessarily a pitfall, but it's something that you would like in general and something that you learned about or something that you would just appreciate an employer um, moving forward. So once that reflecting is done and thinking about the past and really diving into what it is, what it is that, uh, that uh, you need to improve upon when it comes to this new job, um, getting clear on what your wants and needs are. So this kind of surpasses what went wrong or what went right and what's missing. It, it's more about like, in general, what are your wants and needs as a person? What are your wants and needs in your career? Um, and then really getting clear on what those things are so that you can find an environment that aligns with that. And think about the career that you want. So this kind of plays into the ambitious mindset. This is where it's a strength rather than a weakness. Um, 
think about the things that you want to accomplish in your career. Think about the direction that you want to go into. Um, and this is another reason why survival mindset is dangerous because you are not taking any of this into account. You just need to leave. But there's a lot of things mentioned here that will help you to determine what's a good fit moving forward and what isn't. When you walk into the interview process, you'll be completely clear because you've done this work. So don't skip out on this. So here's some things to consider uh, and might be slightly outside of the scope of this talk, meaning that I would want to spend a lot more time on it than I have today. Um, but something to consider heavily when it comes to the basically the journaling or the documenting of, of your past experiences um, is your mental health. You need to take into account where you are mentally. So if you're severely burnt out, um, that's going to affect your work and you need to worry about recovery. A lot of people believe that once you leave the environment that burnt you out, that you'll all of a sudden be be cured and your burnout will immediately dissipate and you'll be able to move on and, and go back to normal. Unfortunately, um, I have some bad news for you. It doesn't work like that. Your body is not a machine. As much as we work with machines, you are not one. And um, because of that fact, uh, there are just simple limitations that you will experience as a human being. And one of those is that it takes time to recover from burnout, especially considering how long you were probably burnt out. So when you take all of that into account, uh, mental health is something you really need to take time and assess yourself for. Not to say that if you're not in the best position that you can't work for someone else, um, that would be up to your doctor and you to determine, but more so to say that you'll be careful about the types of jobs that you sign up for. If you know you're burnt out, going into a fast paced environment is probably going to um, lessen if not completely remove your recovery. Um, and so that's probably not the best fit for you at this time. You may want to consider that flow. If you have struggled a lot with depression and you've needed time away for, for, for whatever reason, you need to consider these things when it comes to the work environment kind of helping with those things. Do they offer mental health benefits? Um, do they have uh, any kind of leave that you can take advantage of in case something happens? Um, do they have good health insurance so that you'll be able to cover those things? So you have to think about it of course from a medical perspective as well um, but mostly here I'm thinking about where you are mentally if you're having panic attacks all the time you're having a lot of symptoms of burnout you need to take that you need to take that into consideration when it comes to looking for a new job and the right employer to move to next the next thing is your life goals you really have to think about your personal goals um, as much as we like to say that uh, work is work and personal is personal and they don't mix. It's just not true. Again, we are human beings and we are human beings who show up to work. And as such, we do need to consider our outside lives when it comes to choosing what our nine to five is going to be. Nine to five is 40 hours of every week, 40 hours. And you spend another eight times seven, so 56 hours <laughs> sleeping um, if you're getting the right sleep. And so that doesn't leave a lot left in the day or in the week for you to do anything with. So if you're going to be spending 40 hours plus anywhere, you want to make sure that that place aligns with your, uh, with your life goals in some way, shape, or form, whether that be work-life balance, compensation, benefits, a uh, proper career trajectory, any travel included, side work, you name it. Um, those things need to be factored in when it comes to, uh, to this job search as well. Uh, who you are definitely matters. Uh, that will help you when it comes to conversations about culture, uh, team fit, those types of things. Even the way that you and your manager's relationship will be, learning who you are and taking stock of that and practicing self-awareness about that will help you tremendously when it comes to understanding if the person you're talking to is a fit for you or, or if you're a fit for that environment or not. Trust me on this. Also your purpose. Um, if you have one, I believe everyone has one, whether chosen or you feel like it was some other calling. Um, if you have one and it's tied to work, it's definitely important for you to take that into consideration when it comes to considering who your next employer is going to be. So if I feel like I was meant to speak and I am talking to an employer who's not a fan of me speaking, that's 
going against what my purpose or calling is and therefore is probably not the best fit. I will probably not be happy there over the long term. So these are all things to consider when it comes to this process as well. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have the time to really dive deep into examples of each of these. Just wanted to highlight them. So now we're back with Sage, uh, our example for this talk. So this is Sage reflecting on the past. And I wanted to give some examples of what that looks like, just in case you were kind of stuck or you hadn't considered certain things or to just get the juices flowing in terms of your brain, your brainstorming on, on these questions. Cause they can be very big questions, especially when you're not happy at a position. All you can think of is what went wrong. You might not have any idea what went right. Um, so hopefully this will help. So when it comes to what went well in her previous roles, uh, she had a very flexible schedule, which she loved. Um, she has a dog, so she enjoyed being able to sleep in a little bit, play around with her dog, go into work, um, you know, do something, go back home. That kind of flexibility was definitely great for her. She had lots of autonomy, which was very important to her because she's the type of person that can come in, be told the general idea, and then take names. Um, she doesn't need someone to hover or micromanage and has had problems in the past with hovering and micromanaging. So the environments with which she had lots of autonomy, she actually did her best work. And great benefits. I mean, who doesn't enjoy that? <laughs> so she had great benefits at her previous employers. Um, uh, so that's another thing that she experienced that went well. Now, what went wrong for Sage is basically uh, the fact that she had strained relationships with her boss, uh, particularly in the very last uh, position that she left. Um, there were lots of office politics, which she is severely uninterested in um, that she felt forced to participate in. Um, and then her position had no promotion path. Uh, fortunately, for, fortunately for the company, I guess, and unfortunately for Sage, they ended up outsourcing the department she wanted to move into, um, which rendered her promotion path basically void. So that definitely put some new stress on her ambition mindset uh, and had her eyes kind of darting <laughs> towards the door. So when it came to what's missing, uh, she basically assessed that she needed a higher salary based on what the market value for her position was. Um, definitely needed more of a training budget in positions because she hadn't experienced that before, but she knows that people were able to negotiate that. Um, and leadership opportunities, you know, Sage has leadership ambitions. Uh, she definitely has leadership dreams and she was not able to explore those opportunities while at her last role. So this is an example of what a reflection looks like. Obviously your list may be longer. I know my list before have been very terribly long <laughs> uh, when it comes to the what went wrong side. Um, but also working in tech, I think I've experienced a lot of what went well too um, in terms of just the stuff that we experience here in the industry and what's missing. I think that's an ever evolving list. Uh, some days I have a conversation with a colleague or a friend in the industry, and then I come up with another what's missing. So um, these are examples of how you can do that process with yourself and what that would look like on paper. So when it comes to Sage's needs and wants, right, we're breaking it down a little bit further so that she can identify what does she absolutely, absolutely need and cannot do without, and what's more of a want, something that she would like to have, but isn't necessarily a deal breaker for her. And when she broke that down, she basically came up with this list, education reimbursement. She would love to go and get her master's degree, but she is not 100% sure yet. Therefore, she doesn't hold it against companies if they don't have tuition reimbursement or any kind of education reimbursement. Um, she also uh, would love remote work capabilities. Like I said, she has a dog. She's very excited about her dog. <laughs> very excited about time spent with her dog. Um, and working from home sometimes helps her to concentrate in ways that she might not be able to manage in the office. So that's definitely something she wants from a job. Uh, great company culture is super important to her. She wants to be able to be herself at all times and she wants that to be accepted. So she notices that she thrives in a great company culture as well and equity. She wants to be able to own a stake of the company that she joins. Um, however, this list to the left is kind of like 
hey, this is what I would like. So anybody that has this would probably be at the top of my list. But if I'm getting down to crunch time, money's running out and I have to make a decision, then I wouldn't necessarily discount an opportunity because they don't have these things. Um, because you're not a tree, you can definitely move away from wherever you join if you need to. Uh, but uh, you have to really assess all parts of the equation to be able to make an informed decision. When it comes to her needs, they're a lot more ironclad. They're a lot more solid, higher salary. She needs that. <laughs> uh, great insurance. Uh, she has suffered burnout before. She wants to make sure there's support for her when in the event that it happens again, depending on the way things go. Uh, promotion path is a need because for her in an ambitious mindset, she definitely, definitely needs um, a lot of incentive to keep going, keep overachieving. Um, and one of that is knowing that there's a path forward. Um, Work-life balance, super important to her. She has a life outside of work and she wants to maintain that. Um, flexible schedule, like I mentioned before, very important to her for multiple different reasons. One of them being her pup. Um, an adequate PTO policy, uh, meaning that she has a number inside her head of what are appropriate amount of days up to get off of the year um, and will not budge up. So these are examples of what your wants and needs list might look like. For Sage, this works. For me, I need education reimbursement. <laughs> I like to train. So that's more important for me. But for Sage, she was like, mm, this might not be that, more, that much important to me. So depending on what your um, journey is with that, that will decide what your needs and wants look like. Your list must might be longer, it should be, um, uh, or shorter, which I don't think so, but um, having this list definitely helps you when it comes to uh, the interview process. So ultimately, what does Sage want out of a career? Uh, which is the last section of reflecting or of, of kind of like getting clarity that you'll need to do. Um, Sage long-term wants to be a chief officer. She wants to be either a chief security officer or a chief information security officer. So she wants to go all the way to the proverbial top. Um, in the short term, she'd like to be a manager or a lead. And for her here, short term is anywhere in the next five years. Um, and she wants to stay in cybersecurity. So she is committed to this industry. Other career goals that she has, um, CISSP is a goal of hers. Master's degree is a tentative goal of hers. Um, contribute to an open source project and deliver a technical talk. Now, these are all typically common goals for um, people. Of course, depending on personality and values, uh, some of these might not even be on your list. Some of these might, um, but they tend to be what I commonly hear in terms of what people have as goals. And then she has her personal goals here. It's like she wants to travel more and she wants to learn a new language. So somehow uh, that doesn't seem related to what she does in cybersecurity, but you honestly never know. You never know who will need uh, what. Um, and there are positions where you can travel, uh, where that's a regular part, especially if you're in consulting or something like that, that's a regular. And of course the world is uh, not currently undergoing a pandemic. Um, those things are things she can consider or think about when it comes to deciding which, what new employer is a great fit for her. So um, adding personal goals, though it seems unrelated, you just never know what positions or what opportunities pop up and what would align better with your personal goals as well as your career goals. So it's super important to consider this um, as you're moving along your process. So what is an interview? Um, before I say what this definition is, I wanted to explain myself. I definitely enjoy a good definition. I enjoy getting clarity on what a word means. And oftentimes in a conversation, especially when introduced to a new word, I will immediately look it up just to make sure I have a solid understanding of what that word means. I love words. <laughs> and as such, it's only right that I have a definition here in my keynote. Uh, what is an interview? It is simply a meeting of people face to face, especially for a consultation. I thought this definition was great for multiple reasons. It is a meeting, so something super cash. Like, I mean, meetings can be pretty formal. They can also be informal, but there's no distinction here of whether it's formal or, infor or informal, just that it's a meeting of people face-to-face -face in person. Well, in these times, sometimes face-to-face -face is through a machine, um, but especially for consultation. So, 
I kind of like this definition because it talks about it from a perspective of consulting rather than a perspective of I'm up for judgment or I'm up to prove my worth. Um, I'm consulting you and the job that you have available and you're consulting me on if I'm a fit for that job. And that is the exchange that happens in the interview process. So before, so I wanted to get that definition down before we dive into the next section of the talk, which discusses the interview process. So um, interview prep. When it comes to the interview process, it's super important to prep beforehand. A lot of us do it. Sometimes that means reading books on technical topics, making sure you brush up on subjects that are mentioned in the job rec requirements, um, a lot of different things. But people don't really talk about when it comes to um, looking at this from the lens of hiring your boss, uh, you might have some different questions to, to write down, some different prep uh, activities to do before the test, I mean, before the interview. So when it comes to the interview process, we tend to work, at work or focus more on our technical aptitude or our technical ability to do the job, which is a part of it and definitely still should be a part of it. Um, but we should also pivot to what can this job do for me and does it align with any of the things that I took the time to get clear on before this interview. So the things that you should do or things that you should add to your interview prep is writing down questions beforehand. We've all been told this. We've all been told this, at least I have a bunch of times from like college prep classes um, in high school till I don't even know, maybe a couple of years ago, I've definitely heard and I know everyone has heard write down questions to take. However, the idea has always been write down a question to ask because it looks good, not necessarily because it's some, some information that you need to make your own decision when it comes to you getting an offer. Um, so I wanted to kind of call that out because I might have been the only one that didn't understand that. I, I could have, um, but with the conversations I've had, I don't think that I am. <laughs> Some of us do not think about it from the perspective of, oh, wait, I've done this. I, I, I actually could ask questions that will help me know if this job is a good fit for me. Um, and I will tell a story, actually, about the first time I ever um, prepared for an interview in this way. Uh, I ended up going up for a security position, um, my second one ever. And at this point, I was exhausted. I was tired, exhausted, worn out by um, leaving jobs and having to do so regularly because I wasn't a fit for the environment. And um, I kind of am decisive about that kind of thing. So at this point, I knew myself very well. I knew what I expected from a job very well. And I knew what would help me be a better worker, at least from what my failures uh, had been. And I also knew what would contribute to burnout because I had already experienced burnout before getting into security. And um, I was uncompromising on uh, what I wanted out of a job situation. So when I went into this interview process, I was very clear. I had done what I had just, what I've just told you, and I really taken stock of the ways that I was, I needed to improve on my own self as an IC. But also I thought about the ways in which my job environment, uh, my relationship with my boss, various different things, company culture, how that affected my trajectory as well, and how that affected my experience as well, and how that affected my job satisfaction. So given all of that, um, I took that and I came into this interview and I kind of didn't care whether they said yes or no, whether they wanted me or not. I was for the first time ever more concerned with whether or not I wanted them, whether or not I was interested in continuing this um, and whether or not this was just going to be me repeating the same patterns that I had seen in the past because of my negligence when it came to picking a proper employer for me to work in. So with that being said, these tips are definitely going to help because they've helped me so much. I have much higher job satisfaction than I've ever had before. And that's because of doing due diligence um, and also of the processes that I discuss here in this next section. So when it comes to interview prep, 
writing down questions beforehand is definitely important and making sure those questions come from what your wants, your needs are, the reflections that you made um, and your career goals is, is pertinent. Um, writing down red flags and non-negotiables also pertinent. It's some, it's a different kind of energy when you're sitting in the room across from someone that is going to either be someone in your life for the next X amount of time or someone you never talk to again. And so you kind of feel awkward uh, about uh, certain things. You're on the wire. You might not remember what a red flag is and what your non-negotiables are, but making sure they're written down, whether you consult it after the interview or right there in the interview is definitely something I would do. Update your resume, of course, this is a no brainer. You wanna make sure it's up to date and has all the, the latest information um, and do something that makes you feel confident. Uh, honestly, I think for me, I wore, I bought a new outfit because <laughs> new outfits make me feel confident, especially if I really enjoy the outfit. So for me, I bought a new outfit. Um, if that's not what you're able to do, there's something that you may be playing a, a, a game like that. Playing Assassin's Creed for me also makes me feel confident depending on what missions I'm doing. So maybe playing a video game, uh, maybe talking to a friend that's a hype man, whatever you got to do to be confident before this interview is definitely important. And it's definitely going to feed in the energy that you bring into the space uh, when it is time for the interview. So here's how Sage's questions for the interview looks. What does an average day look like for someone in this role? I've asked this question many different times and it's very important to ask. Um, hopefully you also have skills into parsing through certain unsaid information. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes someone answers verbally one way, but there's other context available to you to understand the fullness of what they're trying to say to you. So if the person is kind of saying, Ah, oh, an average day, super, super breezy. There's absolutely no work, um, but their eyes are kind of shifting or they're kind of shuffling uncomfortably. They might not mean fully what they say. <laughs> uh, so trying your best, of course, don't make up stories, but trying your best to understand body language and, and see how people answer the question is definitely important here because what the average day looks like is a peek into your life. Uh, and when you think about that, when you think about the peak into your life, you must be very interested in what the answer is. If you're currently burnt out and they're saying that from the moment you open your eyes to the moment you close them at night, you are working, you're probably going to say thank you, but no thank you at the same time. Um, but if it's super simple work and um, very light, but challenging sometimes or more balanced, whatever the space may be, whatever you need at that moment, definitely perk your ears up for that information because it helps you understand, is this a good fit or not? So great question for an interview. Another question is, what is something you love about working here? So this gives people a good chance to highlight something amazing about where they work. And if somebody truly loves where they work, it'll be super easy to answer that question. Um, and what I liked about my current role, and this is me, Stephanie, not Sage, um, is that when I asked this question to one of my teammates, his eyes lit up, actually lit up like, like it was Christmas, um, which kind of showed me that, okay, this person really enjoys working here. Now, why is very something you have to figure out, <laughs> but for whatever reason, they're very happy to be there and that's a good sign. So definitely asking what's something you love and seeing how they react to that question and how they answer is definitely important. But equally as important is what's something you hate about working here? And I use the word hate on purpose. I think people are very uncomfortable with that word. Um, so when I tend to use that word in interviews, it definitely shows me the reaction. Now, I want to say nine times out of 10, uh, folks pretty much respond and say, I wouldn't say necessarily hate. I would say I probably dislike. Um, I've gotten a strong dislike once, but for the most part, they're not going to, typically people don't admit to like deep disdain for something um, in the interview process when they're trying to incentivize you to join. Um, but it gives you a clearer picture. If the person's kind of dodgy or they say something kind of vague, there's more to the story. If they answer directly and honestly or candidly, um, and you can kind of tell, uh, I think it helps so much with, okay, so this person is number one, the environment that they're in doesn't make them scared to answer this question honestly. Um, but also number two, 
um, this person is informing me about something that I wouldn't have found anywhere else. So great, great things to ask. Um, another thing to ask is, are there any opportunities for advancement or professional development? So for Sage, this is super important because it's a non-negotiable for her that she has somewhere with upward mobility. If there is no upward mobility, she is not interested. It doesn't work for her. She's already tried it, got the t-shirt and decided to return it. So for her, that's a very important question and asking, um, I will say in experience that sometimes you have non-committal answers of yes we definitely like to invest in our coworker. i mean in our employees but no specifics tied to that i think what i liked about my current position is that they immediately told me about the plans they have for um, education advancement and professional development um, and it was definitely a topic of conversation still is um, surrounding uh, my my journey uh, with my current company. So definitely something important to ask and the answer is super important here. And lastly, she has, can you tell me about who I will be working with? Considering that I said 40 hours of the week will be spent with these individuals, it is so important for you to understand who they are, what they're like, what is the, what is the team like, how often do they get together, specific questions about that. Once you get hired, you cannot change who your teammates are. Um, you can kind of hope, you know, ill wish that they end up leaving or something ends up happening, but that is pretty much a wish. Um, you will be stuck working with this person for your dura the duration of your time or their time. Uh, so getting a peek into how that, what that looks like. Also, what is the load? Do I have a team of one? Do I have a team of 10? How much support will I have on a given basis? Definitely important because again, you're considering other things like mental health, you're considering life goals, et cetera. You can't have work-life balance if you're the only person doing a thing. Um, it's just literally hard. I don't know a single person doing it. <laughs> I have tried and failed. So um, knowing what the team is like, the size of the team, what the dynamics are, asking those questions and seeing what the response is, definitely important here. So as it pertains to Sage's red flags, um, Sage is over work-life balance not being a thing. She really would not like to partake in that anymore. Um, and schedule inflexibility. She's definitely not a fan of that. Uh, for her, she's just seen how it just ends up working horribly. Um, and for me personally, I definitely have seen the same thing. I think when um, people are sticklers for a specific schedule, um, I tend to not flourish as well as when I'm allowed to come in when I am able to. Um, and not to say that I just come in at 1 p.m. or anything like that, but more so having a flexibility of coming anywhere from 8 to 10 is a really great, uh, a really great feature when it comes to when you're creatively your best, when you're able to show up your best. And I show up my best a lot, off, a lot more often with that flexibility. So definitely important to consider for Sage as well, probably for different reasons, I don't know. Um, no training opportunities or upward mobility. So for her, she might not be upset if you don't have any, um, any education reimbursement as identified in her wants. Uh, however, it's a red flag for her. If you're not investing in your employees, why? What is the purpose of it? Why is it just a transaction if I do this work and then you reward me by um, giving me a paycheck? What more do you need to invest in your employees or what is the reason for you not doing so? Definitely a question that needs to be asked. Definitely a red flag. Maybe not something that's a deal breaker at the, back, at the top of it, but something to consider. One person team for Sage does not work. She is not interested in it. She's good. Um, and as I said before, it is because she understands the weight that that carries. Um, so she's just simply not interested in being on a one person team ever again. And that's a red flag for her because she feels like that would mean overwork. That immediately equals overwork. Leadership incompatibility. Like I mentioned before, she has a, stra a current strained relationship with her boss. So she would definitely want, not want to move into a new situation where there's another strained relationship. So that's definitely something that's going to be bad if she's interviewing her potential boss and there's friction or anything um, weird going on there. And lastly, vague answers. 
vague answers to me, Stephanie, <laughs> vague answers always signify some sort of uh, cover up or something is going on um, or they can't speak freely, which is also a danger, danger moment. Um, so with all that being said, vague answers for Sage, she agrees, um, is definitely a red flag and something to pay attention to. So an important thing to do is to shift your mindset right before the interview as well. These are some of the things that you should be thinking. Whether you believe them fully or not, they should be the energy with which you carry when you're going into an interview. Um, it just helps you really hit some things uh, topic-wise that you might not have hit before. It helps you address things more confidently. You think of, you think more clearly. Um, not sure if anyone knows, but anxiety is actually the worst for our thinking. Uh, we make the worst decisions when we are wired. Um, and that is because our bodies are in fight or flight mode, which means I just want to survive. Um, I'm not really thinking about the consequences or repercussions of my actions. I'm just trying to get past this moment. Um, so when it comes to uh, your mindset shift, you should be thinking of yourself as an asset. You would not want to think of yourself as trash. So the opposite of that is an asset. I am someone who is valuable to someone else. Uh, someone has paid me already to do this thing, and someone will probably pay me again to do this thing even if your confidence is a little shot on that because of whatever feeling that you might have, believing this or chanting this to yourself, so, so helpful for getting through the moment. You don't need to be confident forever. You just need to be confident enough for an hour or two or three while you do your interview and then you can shed the facade. Um, so here's where fake it till you make it definitely shines through. Um, like I said, someone's paid you to do this job before. Uh, if this is your second time, if this, if this is your first time, you know, someone's paid you to do a job period before, um, which is something that you should think about. Um, doing these steps, taking these measures definitely help you be more powerful and step into that power more uh, because you're coming into it proactively instead of reactively. So remembering that you have the power in your career and you have the power to accept or deny anything that doesn't fit what you'd like is definitely something you should think about before the interview. You wanna make sure that you and the company are getting what you're paying for. So another thing to think about when it comes to the interview is just the logical mindset of, this should be a mutually beneficial situation. I should be the worker that you need and you should be the employer that I need, um, especially if I have the luxury of being able to decide. So when it comes to that mindset shift, I think it's very powerful and important to understand that this is a transaction because it is. Until you get the warm and fuzzies from working there for an extended period of time, in the beginning, it is a transaction. You are looking to them to see, are you the employer that I can stay with, build with, grow with, um, or not? And they wanna see the same thing out of you. So understanding that there is a two side to that conversation is very important when it comes to shifting your mindset before the interview. So during the interview, remember, it's a conversation. The conversation happens between two people. It's not a monologue. It's not a performance. You're not there to watch and listen and that's it. And you clap and go home. You are actually there to participate in the discussion when it comes to your future and their future. So remembering that it's just a conversation helps me so much with easing my nerves because it's like, I've had a million conversations. I have conversations with a whole bunch of people. I've had a podcast, so I definitely have had conversations there too. Um, so remembering that helps with my nerves a lot. Interjecting politely when you need to is definitely very important, especially considering that it is your time to. Uh, and if you feel that it is a Maybe if you're nervous about um, interjecting or interrupting, something you can ask ahead of time is, if I have questions during the discussion, how would you like me to handle them? Would you like me to wait until you're done? Or is it okay if I interject at any moment? Uh, sometimes they'll do the work for you and tell you, it's okay if you interrupt me, I'm gonna blather along. That's definitely happened in a couple of interviews. Um, but if not, you can always set the tone from your perspective of saying, hey, I probably will have a tendency of wanting to interject, is that okay? Would you like me to do it a different way? definitely something that you can consider. Um, listen for the red flag that we've discussed before. Definitely pay attention and take note. Um, I've actually 
been able to mentally take note somehow and remember what the red flags were, maybe because they're glaringly obvious to me <laughs> when I do hear them because of the clarity I have about what I want. Uh, so I don't need to write them down, but if you need to, take the opportunity to do so. Um, if you feel a little uncomfortable about that, you can always um, maybe uh, ask if it's okay if you write notes during it or maybe just try to write the notes after. I do know someone who would wait until after the interview was done and then write the notes. So definitely different ways that you can handle um, making sure you take note of what the red flags are. Uh, ask follow-up questions for clarity. Sometimes you might get a vague answer, but it's not because the person is being shifty or dodgy. It's simply because the answer is really big and you might not have the context and it might be a too long of a story. So sometimes a quick follow-up question can clear that up and you can understand, okay, this is why they don't want to dive in deep here, or this is why they don't feel like I need that information, et cetera, et cetera. So asking follow-up questions for clarity is definitely something you should do during the interview. And also don't think about or focus on any of your shortcomings at all. In fact, don't let it come to mind. Don't really worry about it because that's not your job. In the interview process, your job is to think about how does this job help move me forward? And how does this job help me with my job satisfaction? And how does this job take me towards my life goals and my career goals? And how does this job align with my purpose? You are not there to think about what they think about you. That's their job. And they will do that. They will do that job. They have done that job. And they have no problems doing that job. They do not need your permission to do that job. So when it comes to uh, the interview process, you have to think about what's in it for you. And you have to have this mindset. Only during the interview process, of course, like, you know, during everything else, you can be a human being and, you know, let the warm and fuzzies in. But when it comes to the interview process, you really need to be very clear about the fact that you are an asset. And that is what you're concerned about so that you can get through the interview process. <laughs> So what happens after the interview, aside from a huge sigh of relief? You reflect on the good and the bad. So I always say that at the end of the interview process, you should probably ask the interviewer if there are any notes that they have for you um, from what they've heard from you. Whether it be, do I need more experience? Do you think I should speak up more? Do you think I was softer spoken? How was your perception of me? Definitely questions that you should ask. Um, if you can find, the one I typically ask is, um, are there any notes or feedback uh, that you have for me um, that will help me whether with you or without? Um, I'm always looking to learn and I would like to do so if there's an opportunity here to do so. Um, that is all encompassing, I think, um, and gets people thinking about, okay, well, what was, what was my impression or experience about you? Um, and then giving you the feedback of that. So that's definitely important. Another thing that you should do is something awesome for yourself. So whether that be take yourself out to eat, go out with friends, visit family, snuggle with your dog, you need to reward yourself for doing that. Interviews are so challenging. They're so hard, so daunting, and it takes so much to do them <laughs> and to get to that point that in order to just have a good dopamine hit, it's great to just do something awesome for yourself, even though if it's as simple as just curling up in bed with a book. Um, something that makes you feel good, definitely take the time to do that and refine your wants, needs, and your goals. You may find some information out during the interview process that will highlight more of what you want in life or might highlight something that you don't really want in life. Um, it definitely depends on how the interview goes and what you learn there. Um, or you might find out that things are not as important as you thought that they were um, and that you're willing to make certain, certain sacrifices depending on what the job is. Um, all of those things are definitely on the table when it comes to refining your wants and needs. And then clap for yourself because you've done it and it's great. And I feel like it's, it's a lot to put yourself out there. It's a lot to feign uh, confidence when we have imposter syndrome. So if you take the time to do it, it should be acknowledged. Um, if not by anyone but yourself, so be it. So what's next for Sage? Where does she go from here after going through the interview process, changing her mindset, refining what she wants and what she needs from an employer? What happens next for her? So 
she's more confident in interviews, learning that it's a transaction and that it's nothing personal at all based on who she, what her worth is or who she is, helps her to maintain confidence when it comes into these spaces. I can be ambitious and I can also acknowledge that I would like to very much leave my current role without setting myself up or playing myself. And how do I do that? By being more proactive when it comes to my approach to it rather than reactive and put myself in a bad situation. So she's more confident when it comes to interviews. She has way, a way higher potential for job satisfaction, for higher job satisfaction, because she's taking the time out to understand what she wants, what she needs and who she is. Um, therefore, it's super clear who would not align with that. And it makes um, a, lot, a lot higher potential for job satisfaction in the end of that has greater clarity on internal desires. So this process actually is a twofer. It gives you clarity on what journey you wanna go on, where you wanna go. A lot of us, or some of us, don't really have a plan, don't really think that far ahead, um, are just committed to the next baby goal. But sometimes having a huge goal helps us refine what a baby goal should be um, and what shouldn't be on our radar at all. So going through this process helps just even on the personal level of where do I want to go and how can I align myself to what I want to do in the future? And also she realizes that she is the prize, um, which is a huge deal. I feel like realizing you're the prize is probably the beginning of a great new relationship when it comes to jobs. I think that um, jobs and employers will understand that you value yourself. You will understand that you value yourself and they will value much, you much more because of it. So Definitely a great, a great transition for Sage from the uh, girl that we knew in the beginning who was just in a really tough situation um, and didn't know the way out. So uh, we are done with Sage for now. <laughs> now we're moving on to resources. So when it comes to this job searching process, there is definitely um, some resources that I have not mentioned um, that take a little bit more time to either build or, um, or do. Uh, but I still think are important to note in case uh, you need some assistance when it comes to this process. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, networking and a book that definitely has helped me um, and the ways in which I network next. So for me, I am an introvert, though it is probably not clear because I am sitting in front of you keynoting um, an event. <laughs> uh, but I am an introvert and I do not enjoy networking. I think that it is a uh, personal hell for me, uh, mostly because there's a bunch of small talk and I absolutely cringe on the inside when it comes to small talk. I'm someone that will talk with a complete stranger about, um, I don't know, trauma, <laughs> but I will not want to talk to them about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> that will immediately drain me. So uh, when it comes to networking events, I most certainly don't even meet anyone. I sit in some corner and I say, if somebody talks to me, then cool. If not, I am completely fine sitting here. So as someone who has had an ambitious mindset, I definitely had to figure out what was the best way for Stephanie to network in a way that just went more with my personality. Um, and that was the following. Volunteering. So volunteering for stuff, whether that be um, in the past, I volunteered for WISP, uh, which is Women in Security and Privacy, um, and they provide scholarships for women um, and um, non-binary folk to attend different conferences or be a part of different trainings and things like that. And so I was volunteering with them to be a lead for uh, DEF CON you know, two years in a row and, um, or one year, <laughs> it was supposed to be two years in a row. <laughs> um, but uh, that was my way of meeting a whole bunch of people who I'm really cool with now, who have helped me in many ways, um, definitely has exposed me to a bunch of people. Um, and WISP has definitely exposed me to the Diana Initiative because I won as a scholar when the first year I ever went to DEF CON. Um, so in a lot of ways, um, volunteering can get you access to different people who may invite you to conferences, you might get a free ticket, you could also um, volunteer at local tech related events or in your city or around you, um, but it's kind of a way of meeting people that isn't so cringe because you walk up to someone at a networking event, they know what it is, it's a networking fence, it's so obvious what you're doing, it can be kind of awkward. Whereas if you're volunteering, you know, you're doing something and you're actually participating in something, you're part of something. So you have more to talk about that's not just the weather or 
the sports team of the city that you're in. <laughs> so speaking, speaking is a great network, networking opportunity. Um, when you have fellow speakers, you definitely get to talk to them about different things um, that can highlight different opportunities for you. And I think it's just a great avenue for putting yourself out there. Also, uh, a lot of people watch a lot of different talks and you never know who's watching. You never know what opportunities can come from that. I have had a lot of opportunities come from speaking engagements, um, both free and paid. And I, I think that um, speaking is definitely an avenue for that. You also gain some great friends and I have some great friends I've met just by speaking in tandem with them or um, in the same conference as them. So uh, definitely something that you can do. Local tech meetup groups, when things are back to normal and it is safe for you to do so, uh, local tech meetup groups are how I met a lot of people locally, um, which definitely helps when it comes to, uh, you know, knowing somebody who knows the landscape in your city. People can give you advice uh, from outside of your city, but it sometimes does not work depending on what the landscape is and what the environment is in your city in terms of uh, the industry. Um, so for instance, Houston's very oil and gas centered. You may go somewhere else that's more of San Jose is probably more techie centered or startup centered. So you probably would have different advice depending on um, who you talk to and, and where they live. Uh, so knowing the people locally, definitely invaluable. Um, security related organizations, uh, that's definitely something that you can do to meet people and isn't as awkward as like a networking event. Um, and social media, social media is a huge one uh, for anyone who's super shy or super reserved or does, don't like to meet people in person. Social media definitely helps you get over that very quickly. Um, at least it did for me. I think I was very, very, not shy, but um, just kind of reserved and, and kind of like to you know, play the play the background and then being on social media, having a voice and uh, a lot of people appreciating it definitely got me out of my shell. And I've definitely met a lot of people from there. And it's the reason why I became a speaker in the first place. Uh, so definitely a great avenue for networking as well. And this lovely book here. Now, I won't spoil the book for you, but I want to rave about it. So I mentioned Kirsten Brazier in the beginning of this talk as one of my mentors um, and one who has helped me so much with my journey. Uh, meeting Kirsten was definitely one of the turning points of my career. And I met her at a time where I was pretty much lost. And a lot of what I came here to talk to you about today was inspired by what she told me when I first met her um, and what she said ever since then. Um, and a lot of what she said is in this book that she's written for women um, on how to get a six-figure career, if that's something that you want. Um, it talks about negotiation. She has perspectives from white males in the industry, which is very important, and how they negotiate um, and being the higher earners um, or historically being the higher earners. It's definitely interesting to see the energy with which they carry when they go into negotiations um, and the confidence with which they ask for what they're they're asking for and what they're asking for. I feel like a lot of it is super eye-opening depending on what you've been exposed to previously. So it's pretty much the best hand guide for someone who doesn't have the networking that I talked about in the previous slide. Um, so networking takes time. Getting to know people takes time. Building relationships take time. Uh, this book, however, is available on Amazon. <laughs> And uh, you can simply go purchase it, read it, and it will tell you some other steps that you can take. Talks about SMART goals, CISSP prep, um, so much information in there. It's definitely helped. It's something I refer to every single time I give advice, um, every single time I am considering um, moving positions or jobs. It definitely has helped me, and I definitely think it's something to check out as well. So when it comes to key takeaways, um, the first thing is you are your greatest asset. Um, as much as you might have people around that you probably love or that definitely are assets in your life, um, they are not you. And they will not live as long as you live or it won't be as directly as impactful. Um, and what I mean by that is that you will live with you guaranteed for the rest of your life. Um, however, you may not live with the other people around you. So 
understanding that you are your greatest asset is definitely important when it comes to hiring the right boss, but just moving in the right direction in general. Um, you have to treat yourself accordingly, which means drop the pick me attitude, drop the pick me mindset, drop the survival mindset, and don't let the ambitious mindset be detrimental to you and recognize that you're your greatest asset. And even if, it, even if you get rejected, it has no bearing on who you are and what you have to bring to the table. You just have to find the right fit. Number two, where you work and the life you have while working there matters. It's all fun and games until you're working 60 hours a week <laughs> and making sure that you don't end up in a situation where that's your reality, knowing that you have other things you might wanna do in this life or knowing that you have other things that you'd like to pour into, whether that be a family, whether that be friends, whether that be traveling, whatever makes your soul happy. Um, making sure that where you want, where you work doesn't directly impact or negatively impact rather that journey or that goal is definitely something important. And last but not least, knowing you're the prize kills imposter syndrome and helps with career happiness. Um, I don't think that there will be a, sick, a single person that says, hey, um, after watching your talk, I felt like I was a prize and then everything went horribly wrong after that fact. Um, me having more confidence ended and resulted in my complete and total demise. That does not pretty much, that's not likely to happen. Um, what's likely to happen is that you step in your confidence and you own yourself and you own where you're at and your skill set. Um, and you get further ahead without having the annoying imposter syndrome in your ear saying that you can't succeed or that you're a fraud or that people are going to find out about you. Um, things that everybody feels. Uh, so knowing you're the prize definitely helps with hurting that imposter syndrome and, and not eradicating it. It's very hard to get rid of, um, but at least uh, affecting it enough to where you can move in power um, and then help you with career happiness overall. Last but not least, I wanted to take the time to discuss this because it's very important. Fire your boss if you need to. Uh, that's a very important thing to say. Um, as my boss actually watches this presentation. Uh, it's very important because I feel like for me and for a lot of people I've talked to over my uh, years in this industry, a lot of people have struggled with a strained um, or harmful relationship with their boss. There's even a saying that says people don't quit bad jobs, they quit bad bosses. And as is such, making sure that that relationship is good, knowing that this person is pretty much the, the, the gatekeeper, the, you know, the, the, the Heimdall, if you will, <laughs> if, you, if you know that Marvel reference, the Heimdall to your career, um, and the only one that can open up the way, the path forward, um, it's really important to have a super solid relationship with that person. Um, and if you're not able to do that, for whatever reason, whether you've tried managing up, whether you've tried different tactics and sought out advice and it's just not working, do not hesitate to fire your boss. It's time to let that job go and go somewhere that you're appreciated, where you can thrive, where you can, where you can experience happiness and not have to worry about the burnout that does come from a strained relationship with your boss. So with that being said, thanks for coming to my TDI talk. You can find me at the following. Uh, my email is listed here. I'm always on Twitter, uh, though less so in the last couple of days while I prepared for this. Um, my website, you can find the links to my Twitter there or my um, LinkedIn there. Um, and you can definitely find me anywhere at Steph and Sec. Um, so I hope that you enjoyed this talk. I will be available for questions. If you've not already asked and I haven't already answered, I'm really excited to get talking to you about what we've discussed today. So thank you so much. And I appreciate every one of you. Hi again, that was a fantastic talk. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, it looks like the feedback has been fantastic. I haven't captured any questions yet. Um, I actually have a few. So I waited until the end um, to address them. I, I found some. Um, 
So one of them was, uh, do you have tips for video interviews because it can be harder to read nonverbals um, over video? And I won't lie, um, I think the last interview process I had for my current job, I had a total of 10 interviews. Um, some of them were virtual, some of them were not because uh, I completely onboarded remotely. So um, facial expressions still give a lot away. You can't see the tensing depending on the angle of the camera, but facial expressions also, word choice is very important and tone. So try to listen more for the other cues that are not as obvious or something that, you know, you, you might take for granted when you're seeing someone, you can take in the full picture. But I think picking up on tone, um, how much a person gives in terms of information, those things are very important and kind of contribute to that. So I definitely understand the challenge, challenge there. So don't beat yourself up if you miss something. Uh, but there are still other cues that you could kind of take note of when it comes to that. So I hope that was helpful. <laughs> awesome. One question I saw was, how do you deal with retaliation when you decide to leave a job? Yeah. So um, the thing about retaliation is that person typically uh, doesn't have, now granted, there are people that have reach outside of the company. But for a lot of these folks, their power and authority kind of live and die in the company that you work for. Um, so there are a lot of things that can happen. Uh, when it comes to retaliation, there's so many different actions that can be taken. So I'm struggling a little bit with this, <laughs> with this answer. Uh, but I think one of the most important things to remember is that you can leave at any point in time. Um, a lot of people will point you towards HR, I'm not going to lie to you. I have not had the best experience with that, though that is pretty much your main option when it comes to the company. Uh, so I tend to hightail it out of there. I tend to leave as soon as possible um, and unfortunately enter into survival mindset, but that's a different case. Uh, once your environment becomes abusive, you really can't do the best for yourself anyway uh, under those restraints. So. That is important. Also, sometimes having an ally and leadership, uh, especially like a different department than yours might be helpful um, as well. I've had the opportunity to move to a different team, which helped with any retaliation that I received. But honestly speaking, if that's able to go on um, and you've consulted the channels that are available to you and nothing's happening, it's really a dicey situation. I tend to just advise to leave if possible. So I know that that was a very <laughs> dramatic ending, but yeah, that's, that's the advice I would give. No, 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 that's great. Um, would you consider it a red flag if the interviewer, interviewer doesn't give you any time to ask questions? Um, yeah, I actually would consider it a red flag, especially considering those interviews are not short. They tend to be like an hour at least or 30 minutes. Uh, if they are not interested in what you have to say at all, or they didn't anticipate that you'd have something to say, I feel like that is indicative of what your experience will be on staff. You will also be muted on staff and you will probably not be listened to. So definitely a red flag, something that I would definitely consider. How much do you talk about your side gigs, like podcasts or blogs during an interview? Are they seen as a plus or a distraction? So funny enough, this the job I have currently is the first time I ever mentioned any of my side stuff, period. Um, I was very nervous about that because in the past, I have not had support when it came to having a life outside of work. Um, so I mentioned it because I felt like it was only going to get worse. And so I needed the employer to know that I am active outside of outside of the job, but in the community. Um, I also feel like it's important for the employer to know that you have network, a network, you have contacts, you have things that you're doing, because uh, it helps them understand that you're of value uh, because you have other options, you have other things to explore. So I do mention it now, I won't lie to you though, I waited until I built up a good network and, and had more confidence in my skill set before doing so. So protect yourself first always, uh, but it's definitely something that I talk about uh, because it's going to come up. I'm gonna need either time off or support. Um, my current role would actually reimburse or help me with travel when it comes to that. So definitely a relief when it comes to some of these events that are not necessarily paid. So 
I think it's important to mention and also hear the response, even if you know you keep it on the hush when you're there, just knowing how they feel about that is definitely a good indication during the interview process. How do you handle conflict between different teams that negatively affect the information security initiatives? This is difficult because as a security, depending on how things are, are sorted in your environment, as a security person, you're often seen as the no guy or the no girl. <laughs> um, and so there could be conflict that arises because of perspective shifts and responsibility shifts. I tend to work closely with leadership. I also tend to like to meet with people one-on-one -on -one virtually if possible um, and kind of cultivate a relationship so that they know that uh, none of this is personal. Most of this is because it's my job uh, as a security practitioner to do certain things. And I honestly would not be talking to them about this if that wasn't the case. Um, so kind of helping to decide, hey, I've got my responsibilities, you've got yours. I wanna hear what your pain points are and I would love for you to hear mine is definitely how you ease up on the tension surrounding uh, how security can function in different IT environments. Um, so that's something I've definitely done. Also, your, your leadership is, a good indication of that. If they don't have good relationships with the other teams, you will struggle because that definitely uh, tracks downward. So that's something that you need to take into consideration as well. Uh, if your boss is not able to manage relationships with the teams, it's going to be challenging, not impossible, but challenging for you as well. So something to think about. I haven't seen that in the question that's come up, but kind of as a follow up to that, in, in your interview process, while you're, you know, deciding who is the right fit for you, how do you get a feel for that, those kind of dynamics and politics in the interview? So as I stated before, I'm a huge psychology nerd. Um, so 95% of our brain activity is subconscious. Um, so when you think about it that way, a lot of times you understand a situation before you consciously process what's going on. So what I'm effectively saying is trust your gut. I think once you're listening to things and paying attention, your brain is working in the background and, and running processes that kind of inform your decision. So if your gut is like, this is a no, 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 run. <laughs> I think you should listen to that. The reason why will probably come up later if you, if you spend enough time reflecting. Um, but I think going with your gut is definitely important, especially if you're in any of the mindsets I talked about. If you're in survival mindset, your gut actually is helpful. It's just that your perspective is off because you're concerned about escaping. So uh, making sure you think about all the things you're escaping from or you're running from in those situations and paying attention to hearing any similarities between the environment you're leaving and the environment you're going to definitely important. Um, but I think writing the list down of the questions that you need beforehand, your non-negotiables, getting clear on that it helps with uh, those situations because sometimes in the moment, you don't have the uh, ability to finesse the situation or even come up with the right questions. Uh, so making sure you write them down, prep a little bit beforehand and kind of get an idea of what kind of questions you're going to ask and what's a like non-negotiable, very, very important. Okay. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're in the last couple of questions as far as time. Uh, one question that was left was, do you believe that it's advisable to, to interview for an internship and ex or accept that with the intention of moving to a different department? Um, this is tricky. This is tricky for a lot of reasons because I think employers have historically, or at least in my experience, they've historically counted that as a bad thing. Uh, however, I think that it's a great thing depending on what your options are. Um, but I also think that you should probably try to go for the internship that's directly tied to what you wanna do. It's just an easier move. I think I've definitely accepted jobs before thinking I would be able to move into a different department, especially when I was trying to get into security. Um, and that was painful. <laughs> it was a very painful process. Uh, you might be dealing with politics you don't understand. You don't, we just talked about a question where a certain teams have um, friction between them. So you don't know what you're walking into when you do that. And you're not sure how 
you, it basically creates uncertainty um, on your end. I think some employers also consider that not great because they want to hire you for the position that they want to, but we're not worried about them today. <laughs> um, uh, but in terms of your own path, I think it would create some trickiness when it comes to moving if that's not as easy as you would anticipate. Uh, so I would probably go for the internship directly tied to what I want to do rather than the internship that's in a different department but gets me in the company door. It just doesn't always work. But if you've asked during your interview if that's something that happens and if it's the easiest thing, if it's simple or easy, like in my current role, they definitely talk about moving teams all the time. Um, you can definitely uh, do that. I feel like that, there would be no issues there and you'd create relationships before being able to move. I think it's a great, uh, actually a great idea. Um, and sometimes working a different role in the company helps you inform your decisions when you get into the new role. So I definitely think that that's important, but I would ask certain questions before doing that because that's definitely a gamble. Perfect. Thank you for your time. Or is there any, we still have a ton of questions, but we're unfortunately out of time. Um, are, are there any closing remarks or last uh, items you'd like for people to take with them before we close out? Mostly that um, being in a position of power, even if you don't feel like you're you necessarily have power. Um, it actually works. It helps. It kind of emits this energy around you where uh, people just kind of sense that you value yourself. So sometimes spending the time doing cheesy stuff like writing affirmations or a pep talk in the mirror, um, those things seem like cheesy and ineffective, but honestly, they help so much for that energy that you're trying to cultivate and trying to exude when you're in these interview processes. So I just hope that this was very helpful to everyone. And I hope that uh, moving forward when it comes to interviews, that you will try your best to get into a position of power before engaging in those processes. Great, thank you.